Jan. Thanks, Arlen. So I'm Jim Garvin. I'm not yet retired, um, but I'd like to uh, tell you guys about a, a new mission that, that Goddard and Maryland will be doing um, today and uh, hope that in future months we can get some of our Da Vinci team to come talk with you all since um, we're going to be we're going to be doing this thing for the next 10 years. And so we're very excited to have that opportunity. So I'm going to share my screen now and um, go to my presentation, which will be, uh, take me a second to find it, of course, but uh, let me find it. it's right here. I'm sharing and going to full screen right now. There we go. Everyone can see me, just wave your hands. Okay, great. So, um, Thank you all for bearing with me with this virtual attendance. It's a crazy time and uh, we'll do better next time. But uh, today I wanna to tell you, I hope interest you in this new flight project and science mission by, by Goddard. It's the first uh, in-situ mission that Goddard will have operated. And um, it's one that we'll be building parts of right here in Maryland, key instruments, the, the sense sphere, and um, partnering with our colleagues in Denver. And so I'm the principal investigator on this. We've, we've been at this for the last 14, 15 years, bidding many times. And so I want to take you to Venus. So please stay, stay, uh, stay tuned. And if you have the questions, I guess you can put them in the chat or wave hands and use semaphores. So let me start by just telling you that people have asked why Venus, and I just like to set the stage with that. Um, we live on earth. We've studied the cosmos here at Goddard with, with great engineering and science feats, but we see Venus in our atmosphere as this incredible chemical fossil record of the evolution of a planet with a climate atmosphere, maybe a hydrosphere that has been untouched, if you will, for decades. And so it's an opportunity for us to build on that gap by bringing the kind of instrumentation, science thinking that we do well at Goddard. And we wanna bring that to Venus. And there's another reason Venus is important because when we think of why now, we're, we're exploring the cosmos with James Webb, Earth with missions like PACE that are coming up, um, SMAP and others, uh, why Venus now? And, and we, we as a community now believe that the Venus atmosphere and that atmosphere's history is important to informing how planets react with their parent suns, how they develop habitable environments, whether they're inhabited we can all debate, and how we use these worlds nearby, and not only our own, to understand the exoplanets we'll be studying in earnest with this new wave of astrophysical observatories. And Venus is kind of the perfect storm. It's a slow rotator, it's Earth-sized, rocky, big atmosphere, climate history that changed, apparently, we think, and yet pretty much unmeasured in situ since the Russians last went in 1985 and our mission in 1978. So as we look at Venus, we realize that to understand how she presents herself is really a story of many different questions. And you all know this, I won't read these to you. These are out of various decadal survey framework documents that talk about the science we're doing, but it all starts with formation, how atmospheres are, are evolved. Um, and a lot of it deals with how a planet establishes habitable environments in oceans, in ice, underground, in atmospheres, and how that habitability, that place where life as we understand it could have existed or even have existed and been preserved, how that endures and is lost. And on Venus, it may have been lost, or maybe it never started. But that's a good question for us in this big NASA Prime Directive of searching for science of life. And so for us, on Da Vinci and all of us studying Venus with other missions also recently selected, we have a prime directive. I hope some of you like Star Trek, but if you don't, my apologies. Um, but really why did the apparent evolutionary histories of Venus and Earth, same size, same neighborhood, same parent star, why do they diverge apparently so dramatically? And is the Venus we see today not the Venus of the past that you see in the picture behind when there may have been liquid bodies of water that persisted for billions of years. And how can we use that to understand the, the rocky atmosphere bearing exoplanets we'll see and we'll be measuring soon with James Webb and other observatories. So for us, this poses even a bigger question. Um, you know, 
is Venus a world that was habitable, that lost that potential, that life force that made our planet and makes our planet interesting? Or was it never possibly ever inhabited or habitable? We can't really tell. There's glimmers from measurements that say, yes, we have a record of water loss, of atmosphere and environment change, of planetary resurfacing at the scale of many times more than our ocean floors. But why did the Venus that we see today, mostly from, from orbiters now, why is it apparently so different? And so the science guidance for studying these worlds um, as written in various reports, this is one from the Academy, that says really this question is, is more complicated. We need to understand where our own solar system planets have gone to read their records and apply them forward to the abundance of exoplanets we see. And that's an important aspect of our mission. How do we do that? So let me continue. So let me remind you a few things about Venus. Um, we live on Earth. I apologize for this quick little tutorial, but Venus is our planet. It's um, at closest approach, about 30 million miles from Earth inside um, the orbit of, of Earth next to our sun. Um, it's just at the edge of what might be called a habitable zone, dominantly carbon dioxide atmosphere with some uh, nitrogen and argon, uh, some water vapor in the clouds, super high surface conditions, as you see at the left, where uh, a runaway greenhouse effect leads to very high temperatures and pressures, um, pressures hotter than your oven, hotter than the melting point of lead and other simple metals on earth. And its surface pressure is equivalent to being about a kilometer deep in the oceans, in the clouds, su super rotating winds, and in the surface, very tranquil, like deep ocean current kind of winds. And that atmosphere in the middle cloud is, is rather corrosive with, with large aerosols of sulfuric acid that have been detected. But most of the bulk chemistry, the gradients, the dynamics, the key species are, are largely unmeasured. And our Pioneer Venus mission in 1978 did a good job as a first start, brilliant job, but a lot of issues. A lot of people think you can't image on Venus, but I'll, I'll share for you um, how that is not the case. So the Venus today, is not this, this climate friendly world like our earth. And you can read the numbers, um, it's rather inhospitable. Many of us think it's volcanically active, erupting in perhaps the style of constrained basaltic eruptions that we see in places like Iceland and Hawaii or even under the ocean. Um, and, and yet we can't even tell that definitively. And so the missions selected in our Da Vinci mission are designed to resolve that situation of, under, of misunderstanding. We've done a lot of great stuff at Mars and the moon, going back to the moon with women. What about Venus? So here is the basis for a large part of my PhD thesis in the mid eighties, which is the imaging record from Soviet landed probes that went to Venus. You see fields of rocks that have been geometrically corrected for a, a strange viewing point. Um, you can see the bust of Lenin in a little pentagon on the lower two frames. And these rockscapes tell a story of geology at the scale of, of a few meters to 100 meters. The horizon is about 200 meters away on these images. And this is it. This is it at the centimeter to meter scale. That's all we got. And that is not enough, uh, together with a, this, uh, a poor understanding of the chemistry near that surface, which is interacting with that atmosphere, to really be dangerous about how Venus works. And then there's the issue of what about the ancient Venus? Some recent models are very exciting. Talk about an early steam atmosphere massive supersaturated water vapor atmosphere that could have persisted for hundreds of millions of years. A long time ago, you can see four billion years on the left. You can see an astronaut um, uh, person there um, with no chance of rain in that environment, as the models by Till Bay and others have suggested, versus the, the models of the oceanic, more clement Venus um, that have been done by our colleagues up at GIS. And these are a juxtaposition. We've had seminars on them. How can we tell? What do we need to know? The real Venus story. And so we need to go to Venus, quite frankly, and make the measurements we're used to making at Mars, at Jupiter, at Titan, um, at the moon, um, in our Earth. We need to make those kind of measurements of Venus where a global change environment over time, perhaps episodic, has cast Venus very differently than Earth. And the view of Venus you see here on the left is a Magellan radar view, colored orange, for convenience that shows mountainous systems and low areas in different shades relative to our ocean world Earth and the perhaps cryo ocean world Mars. So um, 
Venus is exciting because if we play the tape backwards to the early Venus, like early Earth on the far left, you can see a planet with likely early magma oceans, like the early moon, producing an early crust, evolving in the presence of water or not, to produce different time histories of Venus that we can read in the record of chemistry, rocks, um, global assembly, and interior evolution. We can read all of that. But some of the key boundary conditions for that require us to make measurements of the precision we've been making in the last decade or two in other worlds. And that's why da Vinci is important. And I'll explain that. And so the other thing is 100 years ago, some of you um, may have, have, like me, read the papers. I'm just kidding. But in 1919, the New York Times said, life in Venus, that's the place to go um, for various nice reasons by physics. And the artists of today and some very capable scientists believe that the the middle cloud deck of Venus, where the temperature is 10 to 20 C, 0 0.1 to 0.1 bars, rather interesting chemistry would be a place where floating microbial or other kinds of life might exist. But we can't even ask that question today without measuring the chemical context, the environmental conditions of that place to even be dangerous because we have incomplete measurements. And it's, it's almost an embarrassment of not knowing. So here's the story for Venus today. If you look at the atmosphere in cross-section, altitude at the left, up to about 70 kilometers, that's sort of above the upper cloud deck, down to the surface uh, where there's over 10 kilometers of relief. Earth has more, but still Venus is quite like Earth in terms of range of relief. You can see that the lower 75% of the atmosphere mass, the entire Venus troposphere is measured with just a few data points. And we don't even know the temperature lapse rate very well. And while measurements made by landers from the Soviet Union have produced good measurements, um, really interesting stuff, and the Magellan radars painted that whole surface at about 150 to 200 meters resolution with radars, we still don't know the chemical details, the mixing details, dynamic scales, winds, all of those are gaps that we need to fill in. And so da Vinci was designed over multiple competed iterations. Uh, we compete to, to fly these missions, as you all know. Um, to address those issues, both with an in-situ flying laboratory, but also with a, a flyby of Venus phase with new classes of remote sensing instruments that some of you are experts in. I know Arlen would love to hear about our hyperspectral um, ultraviolet spectrometer. So this is our Da Vinci mission. It's a battered-led mission with battered PI and deputy PIs. Myself with Stephanie and Jada, um, Goddard Project Management, um, and Goddard's building one of the prime flight systems, this, this meter diameter titanium sphere that we call the descent sphere or the probe, um, where we will pack five key instruments um, that will transect that atmosphere in about an hour um, in about 10 years, and um, in about nine years from now. But the reason I show this thing is our partners really matter. They're partnering with Rocky Martin to carry us, to get us there, to relay our data, to help us build the aeroshell that carries our probe, parachute system, and with instruments coming from other prime centers, including Goddard, but also JPL and MSQ, and with partnerships with Langley and Ames, Kinetics in, in Michigan, um, and the Applied Physics Lab. So this is a mission that's very Maryland-centric, and we're, we want to make this mission all about using what we know about our Earth as we explore exoplanets, connecting it through the lens of Venus. And so we're excited. And I always like to share a little history, forgive me, I was a big fan of, of Leonardo da Vinci as a kid, went to the Louvre back when it wasn't as hard to go, sat there and watched Mona Lisa stare at me in a frightening way, but reminded the Leonardo's vision across all the aspects of science, technology, engineering, uh, art, and math to produce creative ideas that we're borrowing from with a vision to explore Venus in new ways, up close, chemically, in person, in ways that no one's ever done before. And that's what da Vinci is all about. Bringing da Vinci, the person's vision, now 500 years since he passed, to understand big science drivers at Venus, as you can see from these framing documents that we use to guide science priorities at NASA, you guys all know these. And so, um, but that's how we've traced our science. Da Vinci is an interdisciplinary mission. Um, and its job will be during multiple mission phases with multiple flight systems, all within a discovery program, to get a lot done, to produce almost uh, half a terabit of new science at Venus. And that's lots more than has ever been collected before. Through two flybys with advanced remote sensing of both day side and night side, 
and then setting us up for a descent to carry analytical chemical instruments, environmental sensors, and a new kind of near infrared camera to see Venus as if we were flying there. And our terminal descent velocity is only about 11 or 12 meters a second after we cut our parachute. And that's, you know, the landing G state that many of our Mars rovers come down on, right? That Pathfinder in fact did in the early 2000s. So our mission's about mission phases. Remote sensing to set us up to understand the atmosphere, its dynamics, mystery absorbers, as well as um, where we're going, which will be a mountainous region known as Alpha Regio, the first highlands region of Venus seen by radio telescopes. And our probe um, will come in at high noon over that region, and I'll explain that coming up, um, to do our science. We're also carrying a tech demo instrument that will do 0.2 nanometer spectral resolution, hyperspectral ultraviolet spectroscopy, and of student collaboration to measure the partial pressure of oxygen. So this is probably the most, uh, which I say engineering exciting part of our mission. Um, after flying by Venus twice, setting us up to come around with the flight dynamics to come in um, and release our probe into the Venus uh, upper atmosphere for, for atmosphere entry interface about 120 kilometers. And then after some uh, interfacing through that, that um, plasma, heating zone at 300 watts per meter squared energetics will come in on our heat shield, develop by Lockheed Martin, and enter the atmosphere and then pop out of the air shell and, and, and throw a parachute um, and start our measurements in the clouds. The Venus clouds are very exciting. They're 30 kilometers thick, multi-layered, chemically interesting, reactive, we think. We'll be measuring things in the clouds for about 30 minutes and then cutting the parachute and descending from about 100,000 feet to the surface um, in a free fall dynamic to make measurements for chemistry imaging and touchdown. Our mission does not require landing. We will relay all of our data to our overflying spacecraft and do the mission. And this is the prime slide in my whole talk. We have seven instruments. That's a large uh, payload for a Discovery class mission, fully competed through every stage. Um, our carrier spacecraft, which is about the size of a dining room table, with a big six foot uh, air shell on it and a big six foot antenna. You can see it in the upper left there. <clears throat> that will carry us to Venus, also do our flyby remote sensing, and then uh, release our probe and allow us to be <coughs> ejected into the atmosphere for our hour long descent, uh, which is dictated by the descent <coughs> fault and the relay time we have in, in earshot, in radio earshot with our spacecraft. And during that descent, we'll be making hundreds of measurements of trace gas chemistry, refined measurements of noble gases, dozens of measurements of, of uh, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of water, of carbon and sulfur and oxygen isotopes, and environmental measurements as often as every 15 to 50 meters in the entire atmosphere, pressure, temperature, dynamics, and winds. And then descent imaging, and if we have a good day, uh, up to 500 images from below the clouds to the surface looking through windows that allow us to see that surface at scales we can never see from above. And a student experiment to actually measure this critical parameter, the partial pressure of oxygen near the surface, which dictates mineral reactions. That's a lot to do from this small spacecraft and its carrier. And we're coming into Venus in the mountains that rise 10,000 feet above the terrain. We're intentionally going to the mountains because we think they represent potentially ancient continents or reactivated highlands as the mountains on earth are in places you may all know, the Rockies, the Zagros, whatever. So we're going in to look at the atmosphere on top of these exciting mountains with our probe flight system. Um, and inside that probe is avionics, next generation uh, adjustable data rate radio transceiver, inlet ports um, that are specially heated to not clog, pitot tube-like environments and are at the bottom surrounded by a, a disk of phase change material, a uh, descent imaging system that looks out a sapphire window that will acquire near infrared images. And a lot of the other uh, things you see coming outside of the probe um, the descent sphere are different inlet systems to acquire gas samples and then exhaust them and continue to do so. At some point, we'll be making gas sampling every 150 meters as we descend through the atmosphere and making measurements at that cadence, which is never before been done by a planetary probe. Um, we'll conduct our measurements through the different stratified layers of the atmosphere, distinguishing using double gases between models of Venus 
atmospheric origin, understanding gradients and subcloud composition, looking at all the other things you can read, including the mixing ratio of water, <clears throat> other species, including cycles that could involve phosphorus. Some people have talked about that. And exploring through our images, the composition and three-dimensionality of the mountains. Because we'll be using our camera, not only as a camera, but as a compositional mapper and to make terrain maps. And we think we can do all of this work in our hour-long transect. Just one example, in the mid-atmosphere below the homopause, we will measure, um, after scrubbing out all the uh, things we don't want to look at, the isotopes of xenon, which is the heaviest of the non-reactive nobles. And as you all know, how the isotopes of xenon works is very critical. In fact, if you look at the noble gases, neon up to xenon at the, on the lower axis and their mixing ratio normalized on the vertical axis relative to the sun and earth, you can see this big, huge unknown region for Venus, particularly for Krypton and xenon, where the uncertainties are bigger than the measurement precision. We will resolve that at the scale of smaller than little boxes you see in the plot. And that'll allow us to distinguish what happened to the early atmosphere, early hydrodynamic escape, continuing escape, major impact, blow off, um, radiogenic degassing, constant volcanism, resurfacing. We'll be able to distinguish between those models by measuring these things at a scale that you could measure on labs on Earth and like we've measured recently on Mars with the SAM instrument. Um, and that'll allow us to ask simple questions. How much water does Venus have today? Where did it go? Is it all in the clouds? There's a lot of water in the clouds in terms of mixing ratio. Where, where did it come from? Where did it go? How was it delivered? And what does that tell us about the history of environments? And we do that through the lenses of analytical chemistry by making direct sampled measurements. We're bringing the lab to the problem. We'll also look at degassing um, through different approaches, volcanic resurfacing, active volcanism, long-term degassing just over time as escape works and early degassing from blow off from late heavy bombardment. All these things can be read through the vehicle of particularly the noble gases. So we will make, we hope, the best ever measurements of those in the atmosphere in a place where they will represent the bulk Venus. And we think that's one of the key goals. In fact, Noel Hinners wrote a paper back in 1983 that said, we better do that at Venus. We've listened to Noel, he hired me. So we're gonna do, do that. We're also gonna measure in the deeper atmosphere, starting around 40 kilometers and continuing down, mixing ratios of a lot of key species. You can see them listed here, carbonosulfide, uh, uh, hydrogen disulfide, different species of sulfur as S sub N water, and D to H in water, carbon monoxide, and lots of other species as yet undetermined. And we'll measure them as often as every 100, 150 meters to establish gradients against what we expect. What you see here, are the expected values in equilibrium chemistry models. We don't know that's how Venus works, but if it did, we'd expect these numbers. They're not measured. We will make those measurements. We expect gradients below 20 kilometers as the atmosphere becomes supercritical. So lots to do. I hope you all memorize this diagram on the left. We think the role of oxygen in Venus is very important. I'm kidding, folks. Um, because this wiring diagram you see developed by our team and Misha Zolotov in Arizona, State and others um, is really just a guess of where different species of oxygen go. We know Venus today would look like an oxygen rich world to James Webb. And we might think, oh, that means it's habitable. But we got to separate the Venus oxygen from the processes we expect from those that other exciting things could produce. And so we need to fill in this wiring diagram correctly. This is, you know, our best guess. We know it's wrong. There's kinetics we don't know. But we'll make the measurements to fill it in and couple what we understand about the oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, phosphorus, and other basic um, species to the rocks and to the dynamics on Venus. We'll also ask, as an option on our mission, whether these biogenic trace gases that are so exciting, whether they're there or not, still subject to contention, um, such as phosphine, the so-called swamp gas. And so what we think is going on is something you see at the, at the left, with different reservoirs of phosphorus in the atmosphere based on stability and a few measurements, not of phosphine. But we have an option on our mission to carry an extra sub-element of our Venus tunable laser spectrometer that could measure phosphine up to 10 or 11 times at parts per billion to start looking at whether it is really assigned 
of possible bi biological activity, a biosignature in the atmosphere or not. And we don't know. We know we can get the chemical context to measure the phosphorus cycle, very important. Um, but we'd like to ask, and we're gonna ask the community this summer, is measuring phosphine at those levels uh, an extra risk we should take for the community on our mission? Um, so lots to do. Where are we going? Real estate matters. We can't go everywhere with a probe, as people have pointed out, as you all know. We're gonna go to the mountains of Venus known as Alpha. A very original name, forgive me. It was named by the radio telescope colleagues at Arecibo who first saw it from Earth back in the late 60s. And Alpha is about half the size of Australia. I'm reminded it's twice the size of Texas for you Texans. Um, Maryland would be a little tiny finger in here. This is map at the left is the best of the radar from Magellan and Arecibo combined into a model. You can see the blue, the, uh, the red error ellipse. That's our entry error ellipse coming in. We'll descend in a corridor over that and be able to image it from about 35 kilometers, 110,000 feet, all the way to the surface at scales going from hundreds of meters. We're very used to that looking at Mars and Earth and the moon down to submeters. Um, as you can see in the little diagram at the left, making measurements in the near infrared windows that will let us see the surface in this massive Rayleigh really scattering atmosphere. This is what we'll do, collecting images, um, forgive the little artist rendering. Um, these images will be uh, in multiple band passes, collected in pairs of, of narrow band and broadband, allowing us to use band ratio imaging techniques to tease out differences between rocks at scales that you can read. Our final images, depending on how close we are to the surface and how much data we can get back before we hit the surface at about 20 miles an hour, um, could be better than 20 centimeters per pixel. Most of the atmosphere will blur our images due to the Rayleigh scattering, but the final mile or so would be will be very clear. We know that from the Soviet banners. And while we're while we're descending, we'll also bundle the images together and use machine vision technologies and algorithms that we've been working on for a decade to produce topographic maps. This is the test we did of that in a helicopter out of Wallops. A few years ago, we went up to 6,000 feet and free fell down over a quarry, collecting data and making maps of topography of piles of rocks. Um, extremely exciting with the doors wide open and my seatbelt constantly unfastening. Um, I was not as um, vigilant in watching that because I was excited, but the Wallops team did a great job and we produced demonstration that we can do this kind of measurement of topography. And this is why we do that. You might say this geologist is a nut. We'll use topography, um, we'll use topography to look at the shape of the land. You can see up in the upper left, the topography of some of the mountains in Iran, the Zagros, they're potentially like Venus. And up below, you can see a band ratio composition map using the same bands we have on Da Vinci, showing differences in composition. We can put those together and test ideas. Are those mountains sedimentary, like the ancient Appalachians? Are they young mountains like the yeah. Zagros on Earth, like continents? How are they eroding? Is there signs of volcanism? Can we measure hydrologic processes at fine scales that some colleagues like Paul Byrne at Washington University think could be there? Fantastic, we'll be looking at that. Ultimately though, we wanna see if we can understand Venus the way we, we have learned from Earth in looking at it as a record of history of climates environments and life. Can we read the record to set up the kind of question that's posed in the models at, at, the, at the right um, from a paper by uh, Mike Way and Tony Del Genio? Can we tell? Can we tell that Venus was this hospitable place um, that changed fundamentally? That would be something good to know as we read our own destiny. And ultimately, we're going to test questions about the role of water and other volatiles in Venus through the lens of volcanism that of course, exhale volatiles, liquid water and its, its type of resonance in Venus and the conditions for life. So we can put Venus into context with Earth and Mars. And you can see the little paradigms here. Um, <clears throat> a nice slide that Stephanie Getty, our, one of our deputy PIs put together that shows the possible time history. We hope to separate some of those timings in our science. So what could we find? Well, one of our colleagues, our deputy project scientist and, and Mike Way up at GIST, have thought if Venus did harbor oceans, could it have had long-lived stromat stromatolites, these ancient microbial communities that you can see here from Australia um, that produce bacterial ecosystems that are preserved in the rock record. Could we see that? And 
We can be looking for the chemical signature of those. We're actually doing lab measurements that Erica and Mike are doing to see what their signatures could be like. So let me spend the last couple of minutes finishing. We think da Vinci is a mission about connections. And that's what Goddard does really well. Connecting what we'll learn from James Webb as it potentially sees exovenuses, big, hot, rocky planets around certain classes of suns and stars. We'll be looking for that as James Webb does her thing with great folks like John Mather. We need to look at our Venus so what Webb sees can be compared to what we have. Because that way we can tell different states. Um, we need to understand these false positives that could tell us, wow, all these exoplanets are rich in life, but hold it, Venus looks the same and it's not. So how do we disentangle that? So we think Venus is this perfect ground truth for us to look at what we'll learn from Webb and the next big telescopes recommended by the Academy um, and, and put our solar system into the context of these incredible discovery potential of exoplanets. So we're bringing the legacy of Leonardo to Venus. We have a lot of movies you guys can all see. This is just one that uses a sort of a little uh, cartoon view to show what we can tell on our mission. We believe in communicating that to everyone. We're building hardware that we're testing. We tested an engineering test unit to Venus temperature profile. You can see it at, at the right. Um, the nice uh, uh, titanium sphere actually has been colored by that interesting thermal experience up to 460 degrees C. We tested it with instruments to show we can survive those environments. First time since the 70s, apparently in the US. Our big carrier spacecraft is on the left in a mock-up at Lockheed Martin in Denver. You can see the, the uh, the big uh, antenna that will communicate with our spacecraft as we fly over, and then the heat shield with our probe inside at the top, sort of behind next to the American flag. That spacecraft will carry us to Venus and, and potentially do all the, well, and do the flybys and even have fuel left over to potentially go into orbit if NASA headquarters would like that. Um, we think our job on this mission is to bring great engineering and science together across science themes and to rewrite those textbooks for science and deliver data so the community can have at it. Now, whether these are the covers of our favorite journals or not, you know, I don't know. You can guess as well as I, but we'd like to do this kind of work rapidly with this mission for the community and with the community. Um, we think we'll open a new doorway to understanding Venus with these measurements. It's been a long time since any US mission has been back. Since 1978, it will have been 53 years when we enter that atmosphere. Um, that's multi-generation. Same way we're talking about going back to the moon. You can see a young girl here looking at those records, opening the doorway to make Venus a place. Our team um, here at Goddard and across the community is, is over 100 strong now. It'll rise to over 2,000 people working on Da Vinci as we get ready to launch in June of 2029. Um, we're real excited to bring this mission as the first competed in situ mission developed by Goddard and partners. Um, to our family here at Goddard and to all of you uh, who are Goddard retirees that have seen all the great um, great things Goddard's done over the last 60 years. Um, so we're excited to be bringing this mission to all of you. We think it captures the spirit of what Goddard does well, engineering and science, uh, connecting the dots across the different science disciplines. Um, we cannot wait to do it. And I am so thrilled to be able to tell you about it and hope to bring many of our teammates back to talk to you guys in the future. So I'll stop there and take questions if I can hear them. Not sure I can. And I'm gonna stop sharing now, um, to show you a picture of me with our spacecraft and our Sapphire window, the Eye of Venus, as I end. And thank you all for your time and listening. Um, sorry, I drummed on a little, but I do get excited about this. So let's go to Venus together. I'll uh, stop there and um, stop sharing and go back to you, Jan and uh, Arlen and James and everyone. So. If there's time for questions or comments, or you can fill virtual okay, um, I'm told that's an interesting game these days. Back to you guys. Okay, I'm probably going to get some feedback. But can you hear me? Jim? Yes, Steve. Uh, can't hear me. So that means his, I think his speaker must be bad. Let me hang up. I can type. Something. I can type. Well, I saw you for a minute, Jayan, but yeah, I think your speaker think is bad. bad. Okay. Um.
It's a good view of you, Jan, by the way. Okay. You look good on camera. Okay. You can't even hear that. So let me turn this off. Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask question. Ask Hey, Jan. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Okay, we can hear, everybody can hear you now. Um, Good. We can hear you and you can hear us. And I'll put the microphone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Or comments? Here we go. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, Ernie, there have been measurements of the ionosphere from going back to the 70s. Um, those are not in the set of measurements we'll be making. Um, we did not have room to carry a magnetometer inside our probe. Um, we had looked at it as an option. Some colleagues at Berkeley had offered one to us, and um, but we're a discovery program with a fixed cost cap that is is totally rules the game. And uh, so we have to listen. And so after four competitions to win this one, um, we have to keep keep ourselves in check. And my job as PI is not to let my science ambition tackle everything. Obviously, we'd like to know about the, at least if there is a remnant magnetic field on Venus, it's a slow rotator, so different obvious physics in terms of magnetic fields, but certainly, it's an active planet with, we think, a very, um, uh, what should I say, a very active volcanic uh, heat flow environment and likely a rotating core and all the other good things that have been studied. So that's for other missions. Now, indirectly, our sister mission, Veritas, will look at geophysical parameters through the gravity topography correlation, and they may be able to infer aspects of the questions to ask about magnetic fields. Thanks for the question, Ernie. Anybody else? Uh, what do we know about volcanic activity on Mars? Over the years? So, Arlen, volcanic activity on Venus, I hope you meant. Um, Venus, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah um, Mars is another one, which would be good to talk about, but not now. Um, so, on Venus, we have hints of areas that may be active based on measurements from um, the infrared spectrometers on the Venus Express, ESA's mission, um, and from indirect relook at Magellan data for things that appear to slightly decorrelate. Now, Magellan was not well equipped to do interferometric decorrelation studies, even though Dick Goldstein did succeed a couple of times, which is fantastic. Um, but from the results of the, the Venus Express Virtus experiment, um, that went into the shortwave infrared, we see areas that seem to change on the night side where Venus basically glows in emission um, because of, of the way the atmosphere is somewhat transparent as that glowing. So some people think those anomalies are active volcanism. And there's a couple of areas that have been published about that. Many of us think there's more. So one of the things we'll do is we have a near infrared camera 
on our flyby spacecraft, we will actually make measurements um, on flyby um, and stack up thousands of infrared images over some of the putative volcanic centers. And um, we will then, if, if NASA headquarters wants, be able to put our carrier spacecraft back in Venus orbit in an inclined elliptical orbit to look at those places on the night side for possible thermal anomalies. And we'll have pretty good model-based emissivity sensitivity to detect if there are active regions in the big volcanic centers of Venus, some of which are huge, you know, five times the size of Hawaii. So we think it's active, but we can't prove it. So there may be chemical indicators of that in helium uh, isotopics as well. So we'll be looking for that. Thanks, Dave. Any more questions here? Well, uh, uh, I don't see any more questions, uh, but I have to tell you, Jim, uh, we'd much rather have you here, but your uh, actually the Zoom presentation was uh, went, uh, quite well. We can see the slide well. Uh, so thank you so much again for coming on. Well, thanks, Arlen, and thanks, everyone. And our team, um, and we have a lot of great colleagues here at Goddard, um, we'll be looking forward to coming and talking to you guys, you know, um, when, you know, in several months next year, whatever, Arlen, so we can bring some of our, our super talents, Stephanie Giada, Mike Sakarik, our project system engineer, project manager, all those would love to talk to you guys. And we're going to be at this for the next 10 years. So stay tuned. We're going to Venus. And you're not going to retire until after that, right? Jim? Jim, you're not going to retire until after launch. I, I'm not retiring. I got this mission to deliver. You got at least 10 years ahead of you. So uh, I got 10 years to go, much to my wife's chagrin. But anyway, um, thanks for having me, folks. <laughs>